and in today's video, I know I'm going to be showing you guys the all, well, all 20 of the OWF recordings, every single one. Um, I'm not going to be talking over them or summarizing them or talking about the story that they hold. I'm just going to be leaving you guys with the recordings themselves in case, you know, people want to listen to them. Because I know these tapes can be hard to get. And I, I've seen, like, a couple of people across, like, social media and all that saying that, like, oh, I only have one. I don't know how people already have, like, all 20 and all that. So this is a video for those people. So I hope you guys enjoy and see you guys in the next one. Goodbye. This is Special Agent Sean Keyes, uh, Regional Director of the Otherworldly Lifeform Task Force. The date is uh, February 23rd, 1996. After accepting this position, um, the team felt it would be a good idea to start recording my general thoughts uh, for, for posterity. So, few people have been exposed to the kind of things I'll be seeing, and, and to be honest, I'm not sure if that's exciting or, or terrifying, regardless. Now that I've been fully debriefed, I can get to work investigating this, this fascinating species. Director Peter Keyes, my father, was part of the OWLF in 1987 when first contact was made with the Predator by a team of highly trained Special Forces soldiers in South America. And the Predator was disabled by the last surviving member of the team triggering a powerful self-destruct mechanism. My father and his team interviewed the survivor extensively while an OWLF survey team combed the blast area for any evidence. Um, yeah, besides some additional information on the species from the survivor, the team found very little to recover. Uh, it's been nearly 10 years since first contact, but um, I, I hold out hope that this is a sign of, of things to come. December 3rd, 1996. Things have been moving slowly. I, I knew this would be difficult, but there's finding a needle in a haystack, and then there's finding a needle in 20 haystacks. I've spent most of my time sifting through hundreds of documents and countless data entries trying to understand the predators, a, a name my father apparently gave them. Um, after the OWLF made contact with the survivor of the Valverde encounter, Alan Schaefer, they received a wealth of knowledge that helped define how these creatures operate, luring and stalking prey, skinning them, making trophies of their bones. I mean, these are the hallmarks of a sport hunter, not a simple carnivore. And furthermore, when Schaefer was completely disarmed, the predator removed its own weapons, suggesting a cultural system of honor. And after the first encounter, things started to fall in place. Some details and past stories yielded more data in retrospect. And these notes Looks like we've had multiple documented encounters over the past few years, but nothing that yielded more than stories and other anecdotal evidence. February 12th, 1997. <clears throat> um, the team here has spent the last few years working on countermeasures and uh, other methods for hunting the hunters. If we can get the jump on one of these bastards and catch it alive, the world would change forever. It's strange that nothing has ever been recovered from a predator encounter. No body, limb, even a finger has ever been found, although this isn't entirely surprising. The predator is perfectly designed for covert hunting. I mean, we can't see it because it employs advanced light bending technology that renders it effectively invisible. However, it can see us perfectly through active infrared scanning, and we're betrayed by our own natural body heat. Fortunately, the infrared isn't too advanced. 
Dutch Schaefer was able to evade the predator's sight by covering himself in cool mud. So this led the team to develop a bodysuit that similarly masks the wearer's infrared signature. And, um, we're still working on ways to counteract the cloaking system, but uh, recent efforts have been encouraging. July 2nd, 1997. It's happening. We've gotten word that a crime scene in Los Angeles reportedly contains hanged, scanned bodies. LA's also experiencing a record heat wave, which correlates the data suggesting that ambient heat is a factor when predators choose their hunting grounds. Now, I'm convinced that we're experiencing a new encounter. The field team boarded a plane hours ago and should be on site before the end of the day. To maintain secrecy, my father and the OWLF agents are going undercover as DEA agents investigating drug trafficking in Los Angeles. Our intent is to capture the city hunter alive. Now, with this goal in mind, we've outfitted the team with infrared suits, nitrogen-based freezing mechanisms, and a broad surveillance package to monitor as much of the city as we can. I shouldn't get my hopes up. But this, this still could be some kind of, a, you know, run-of-the-mill homicidal maniac, but I, I wouldn't put money on it. Until our team receives confirmation, we're holding back to prep the lab for receiving. The next few days should be interesting. July 8th, 1997. I just received positive confirmation from the L.A. team. There is an active predator. His hunting ground is downtown Los Angeles. I still haven't fully processed that this is actually happening, but, but I need to, and fast. Uh, the, the surveillance team has been tracking its movements, developing a consistent pattern for how the alien hunts. The rest of the team has set a trap at a slaughterhouse in the warehouse district where the predator's been feeding. A helpful bit of information that uh, confirms the hunting is solely for sport and not nutrition. The plan is to deploy countermeasures, then covertly assault the predator using the heat-dampening suits. It's a risky gambit, but with such a limited timetable, we have to take opportunity when we can. I think it's the best thing that we can just head to L.A. and establish a mobile lab so we can be ready the second predator's captured. If this goes to plan, we'll be involved in one of the most momentous moments in, in human history. July 10th. 1997. It's been uh, several days since uh, since the LA encounter. The director of the OWLF, Peter Jacob Keyes, my father, was killed in the line of duty attempting to capture the predator codenamed City Hunter. I was in Los Angeles that night. Um, prepping the mobile lab for capture, only to receive a panicked message from a survivor of the raid. The city hunter was more prepared than we had thought. We managed to kill most of the team inside the slaughterhouse, including my father. It's a dark day for the OWLF. We failed to give mankind proof we're not alone in the universe while simultaneously letting a threat to our species slip through our grasp. But we have to move forward. While we did fail to capture the city hunter, we collected an impressive amount of data on it. Most significantly, an account from Detective Lieutenant Michael Harrigan, who uh, supposedly killed the city hunter with one of its own weapons. In his statement, he reported that uh, shortly after the city hunter expired, a host of uh, older aliens appeared. And they spared Harrington, allowing him to leave. Taking the city hunter's body with them, they uh, launched their spaceship into the night sky. We retraced Harrigan's steps based on his testimony. And while battling the city hunter must have had its share of collateral damage, there was little evidence that could be differentiated from the normal gang violence found in Los Angeles. However, in a rather nondescript alley, we did find something that, while not worth the price that we paid, will pave the way to making our sacrifices not 
in vain. It was blood. The undeniably extraterrestrial, bioluminescent green blood of the predator. And this, in and of itself, was a remarkable find. But at the end of the blood trail was the city hunter's arm. I immediately ordered for the alley to be quarantined should someone wander onto the find, but I was too late. Somebody was already there. I, uh, I tried to warn the stranger off with our cover story, but he just laughed from inside the shadows. I reached for my sidearm, but then the stranger lit a cigar. And in a sudden bloom of light, I recognized the face of Major Alan Dutch Schaefer. He was older, and he was thinner than the photos we'd had of him, but it was him. OWLF agents swarmed into the alley, but Dutch didn't resist. Did he mean to get caught, or did his curiosity get the better of him? It's, it's hard to say. The last known whereabouts of Major Schaefer were in OWLF custody shortly after having been interviewed by my father, then Special Agent Peter Keyes, shortly after the Valverde incident. The last time I heard of Dutch was when he vanished from OWLF custody after my father had questioned him concerning the events in Valverde. But here he was, in the same place as another predator attack. In the debriefing, he tells me everything, how he was good friends with my father and how he'd been unofficially let go to help hunt down and find these creatures. They've secretly been keeping tabs with each other over the last few years sharing discoveries and leads to different predator encounters and the attempts to stop this threat. After seeing the signs, he too showed up in L.A. to help track down the city hunter, but um, limited resources kept him from getting here in time to do anything. On July 11th, 1997, Dutch has been uh, surprisingly helpful to our efforts. He knew my father, and uh, he was sympathetic about his death. He offered to help us in exchange for funding and a team. Dutch would be our uh, on-site agent for any alien incursion. Uh, and when he says he knows them and how they hunt, I, I, I believe him. Dutch could start bringing back bodies, technology, even just first-hand accounts. We could make huge advancements. But before he left, Dutch brought out what I'd seen briefly in the alley. It was a collapsible spear, the same one the city hunter used against Harrington. He, he wanted to keep it as a down payment. While advanced, the spear was relatively rudimentary. Uh, I was reluctant to let it go, but it seemed like a good faith investment, though. So, I doubt I could have stopped him anyway. Um, the good news is that Dutch gave us a fully functioning alien helmet. Easily the better part of the bargain, besides the wealth of knowledge that the helmet and arm would bring us alone would change the course of history. <sighs> My father's passing has, um, it's, it's been difficult. But everything was finally coming together. It seems now that both Dutch and I are in this together. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know. It, it makes for a, a kind of strange kind of closure, I guess. September 21st, 1997. My father's associate and uh, close friend, Agent Adam Garber, has been chosen to head up OWLF operations, and he's chosen me to help him directly with research and operational efforts. We managed to secure a massive extension to our funding after we presented the helmet and severed predator arm. And after discussing it with Garber, I convinced him to keep Dutch and his crew off the record as much as possible. So Dutch can do so much more working alongside us than he ever could working for us officially. Appropriated funds for Dutch and his team have been marked as cleaning services. 
Studying the arm has revealed so much about the predator physiology, and we are just now scratching the surface of what this helmet can do. There's also a damaged computer attached to the wrist, which uh, Hannah must have been destroyed by whatever severed the arm. It'll be a slow process, deconstructing, analyzing, uh, reverse engineering the alien technology, but every discovery will be monumental as we learn more and more from a species so much more advanced than our own. December 1st, 1997. We ran extensive genetic tests on the arm, the results of which could lead to huge medical breakthroughs. It also gave us clues to the atmospheric makeup of their home world and how viable it would be to sustain human life, should we ever find a way to get there. And judging by the elasticity of the skin, we think that the city hunter was a juvenile of the species. And th this would line up with Detective Harrigan's account of the L.A. encounter. And with that in mind, one could theorize that its hunt may have been an initiation into adulthood. Carbon dating of the bone structure puts the city hunter's age at a minimum of 300 years, which draws into question the lifespan of a predator. If our assumptions are correct, we could be talking upwards of a thousand years, possibly more. I mean, the mask is like a mundane utilitarian item to the predator, but the technology involved is staggering. Aside from the respiratory functions, the visor built into the mask is capable of displaying multiple visual frequencies. I mean, this explains how the city hunter found and killed the OWLF team in the slaughterhouse. I mean, we assumed that they only had access to infrared. But we were clearly wrong. What still confuses me, though, is, is how, with such extraordinary technology, the predators express a seemingly tribal culture. They have uh, such a strong focus on, on honor, trophies, worthy opponents, I mean, things we've left behind as our own species has developed. Um, I mean, is it possible that these technological advances were not developed by the predator species, but taken from another? Oh.